Dear viewers, I welcome you to the lecture series on high performance computer architecture. In 40 lectures, I shall try to provide an overview of computer architecture at different levels and uh, various aspects of advanced computer architecture. And today, we shall start with the first lecture uh, and the title of today, today's lecture is Introduction and Course Outline. So, in this lecture, I shall try to give an introduction of the course and give an outline of the uh, different topics that I shall cover in this course. And here is the outline of today's lecture. First, I shall give a historical background uh, because uh, today we find a, uh, an array of computers, powerful array of computers surrounding us performing uh, different purposes and uh, providing the need of, of, of our daily life. And uh, this, does, this did not happen in a single day and it has taken many years, maybe 100 years to reach this stage. And how gradually we have arrived at this stage, I shall give a kind of uh, evolution uh, that has taken place to reach this particular stage. And uh, in this respect, I shall discuss about five generations of computers and then I shall uh, talk about the elements of modern computers, what are the different components that are pre that builds a modern computer. Then I shall introduce to you the instruction set uh, architecture, which is essentially a programmer's view of the processor and then instruction set processor, which essentially represents the way the processor is uh, realized. Then I shall talk about some related topics uh, like Moore's law, which has helped uh, in, the, uh, in, in the progress of uh, the computers and the uh, Moore's law uh, is, the, uh, is the force behind this uh, gradual evolution of computers. And then I shall discuss about parallelism at different levels. Uh, as we shall see, uh, to reach higher performance, parallelism is, the, parallelism is the key idea and how parallelism have been incorporated at different levels that I shall discuss. And finally, at the end, I shall give an objective of the course and an outline of the course. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the history of computers, uh, as I mentioned, the history uh, encompasses more than 100 years. So, computing equipments are available uh, maybe for hundreds of years and the, the, the period can be divided into two categories. First one is the mechanical era that means prior 1945 uh, and then after 1945 we can say that electronic era. So, in the mechanical era, the computers were built uh, by using uh, mechanical components like uh, I mean uh, wheels and other things. For example, abacus uh, which was invent developed in China that dates back to 500 BC that was used for the purpose of uh, I mean calculation of numbers. Then mechanical adder subtractor. Uh, machine that was built by Blaise Pascal, Blaise Pascal in France in 1942. This again uh, it belongs to this mechanical era because no electronic component was used in building it. Similarly, difference engine uh, that was built by Charles Babbage uh, for polynomial evolution uh, evaluation that was developed uh, in England in 1927. Then binary mechanical computer was developed by uh, Konrad Juice in Germany in 1941. Then electromechanical decimal computer uh, was developed by Howard Eichen in 1944 in Harvard and uh, then Mark I by IBM. Okay, so, this is the mechanical era. Coming to the electronic era, we can again divide in five generation the first generation was before the invention of transistor. Obviously, 
uh, before the invention of transistors, the electronic uh, building block or component that was used is vacuum tubes uh, and uh, that also use relay memories. So, what is a vacuum tube? Vacuum tube uh, uh, was is a, a kind of uh, a, a tube, small tube where with a filament which emits electron and by controlling the flow of electron, the current, the the, the, the by controlling the flow of uh, current, you can uh, actually uh, realize the two states on and off and that is how you can realize a digital computers. So, uh, vacuum tubes were used and relay elements which are essentially switches which are used to store information for uh, as we, we used as memory. And these uh, computers obviously, when used uh, re realized with vacuum tubes, they were very large in size. So, they were uh, usually these, these computers were uh, actually occupying big rooms and uh, obviously, dissipating lots of power and computing power, although the computing power was uh, relatively much smaller uh, in comparison to today's standard. So, may be a thousand times slower uh, and lesser computing power than present day PC uh, that we use nowadays. Then these computers were essentially single user systems. So, single user systems mean that uh, operating system uh, that was used uh, can provide, uh, uh, I mean can, can allow only one user to use the computer. And so far as the programming language is concerned, it was in a very, uh, I mean, primitive stage. That means you can use only machine or assembly language. So uh, these computers were single user systems, and the programming language that was available was uh, machine or assembly language. Obviously, whenever you write a program in machine and as a machine machine language or assembly language, it is very painful machine or assembly language. And uh, to write a program, uh, I mean programming was a big, uh, big challenge. So, uh, these computers were uh, not very user friendly you can say. And examples of this type of computers are ENIAC, Princeton IAS and IBM 701. So, these computers actually the first generation of computers were uh, primarily developed uh, because of the requirement of uh, Department of Defense of USA. So, they wanted to calculate the trajectory of a cell that is launched from the uh, warships and where, where it will fall like that. So, to do that calculation you need a computer. So, these computers were primarily developed for that purpose. So, in 40s. Then came the uh, um, second generation computer in between 1955 and 64. So, in this decade computers were realized by using transistors. So, transistors were invented. Uh, uh, invented and which was used I mean uh, uh, for the realization of computers. So, transistors, diodes and so far as the memory is concerned magnetic ferrite cores were used to store information. Then uh, high level languages were used with compilers that means, uh, now you can write program in high level language and uh, so compilers were developed. So, that was a very uh, big step so far as the uh, users are concerned and also it allowed batch processing. That means, earlier the computers were uh, developed for uh, single user. Now, you can do batch processing that means, a particular computer can be used one after the other by different users. So, uh, the computers like uh, IBM 7090, CDC 1604, UNIVAC, LARC. These are the examples of these second generation computers built using transistors and diodes. Then came the invention of integrated circuits. So, by integrated circuits we mean you can put more than one electronic component like transistors, diode and so on 
on a single silicon wafer. So, uh, depending on the number of active devices that you can put on a single silicon wafers, you can categorize into different type uh, known as uh, sm uh, small scale integration, SSI small scale integration, where you can uh, put uh, maybe 1 to 10 active devices, then MSI where you can put 10 to hundreds of uh, devices uh, like transistors and diodes, then LSI large scale integration where in you can put thousands of devices and nowadays we are in the era of VLSI where you can put millions of transistors or active devices maybe uh, say million to billion, million to billions of transistors you can put on a single IC. So, these are the, the because of the, this evolution of integrated circuit has uh, led to the development of powerful third generation computers using S, uh, but in this third generation only SSI and MSI devices were used and so far as the operating systems are concerned, multi programming and time sharing OS were used and so, um, uh, a single computer can be used by a large number of users and uh, all of them will be having the feeling that they are the sole users of the computer. So, uh, in this category was IBM 360, 370 computers. So, these IBM 367, 370 mainframe computers became very popular and widely used throughout the world and in addition to that you have got CDC. Uh, 6600, Texas Instruments, uh, ASC and PDP-8, these are uh, different uh, third generation computers which were uh, developed by different uh, manufacturers and widely used. Then came the fourth generation as I said uh, with the advancement of VLSI technology, um, these fourth generation computers use VLSI circuits and uh, VLSI circuits and uh, as a consequence they were very powerful and uh, uh, so far as the operating system is concerned multi processor operating system were used. That means, uh, these fourth generation computers uh, it was possible to realize uh, multi processor uh, chips a single IC can contain multiple processors. So, uh, multiple operating systems were developed various high level languages were flourished and parallel processing was uh, was uh, was very popular uh, using these fourth generation computers. That means, it was possible to have parallel processing. Uh, I shall discuss about what are the different types of parallel processing possible in the course of this lecture. And the various computers based on this fourth generation are where IBM 3090. VAX 9000, Cray XMP and then com came the fifth generation uh, uh, which has which has started maybe from 1991 to present day. So, these uses uh, uh, ULSI circuits, ultra large scale integrated circuits and or very high uh, I mean SIC. Mm -hmm. So, these are the different types of uh, very high scale integrated circuits were used in realizing fifth generation computers uh, to realize massively parallel processing and earlier so far as the multiprocessor uh, parallel processing were concerned all the processors were homogeneous that means same type of processors were used in those uh, in those uh, parallel processors but in the fifth generation it was possible to have heterogeneous uh, processors that means one can perform uh, uh, i mean uh, graphics processing one can perform integer processing and so on so uh, different types of uh, heterogeneous processors were combined to realize a uh, uh, thing for computer systems and there are the fifth generation compute examples of this fifth generation computers are intel paragon uh, fujitsu vpp 500 cray mpp so, uh, these are some uh, representative examples, but obviously this list is not complete. There are many more uh, um, fifth generation computers. Coming to uh, the elements of modern computers, 
you can see a modern computer is an integrated system consisting of machine hardware, system software and application program. So, three very important components that makes a computer workable, usable uh, to usable uh, uh, are number one is hardware, you require hardware, second is your system software and third is your application programs, various application programs. And this can be uh, represented with the help of these uh, nested circles. So, as you can see hardware is at the core or center of these three circles. So, hard, uh, hard, this hardware is being uh, is uh, the interface between the application software and hardware is the system software. System software is essentially the operating system and different types of operating systems have evolved over the years and these system software or operating system allows uh, application software to run on this hardware. So, uh, and the actually to the system software or the user or programmer, uh, the functionality of the processor is characterized by instruction set. So, a, a processor can execute a set of instructions and which can be used to write a program. So, program can be considered as a sequence of instructions. So, you can pick up instructions from the instruction set and realize a program. So, uh, a programmer's view of the processor is essentially the instruction set and that is why it is called instruction set architecture. So, instruction set architecture. or ISA in sort uh, plays a very important role and it is a kind of abstraction and uh, all you all programmers can look at it. So, this predefined instruction set is called instruction set architecture. Now, this ISA or instruction set architecture serves as an interface between the hardware and software as I have told. So, here you have got the hardware and here you have got the uh, different types of software like system software, application software and this instruction set architecture serves as an interface between the hardware and software. So, in terms of processor design methodology an ISA can be considered as a specification of, of a design. That means, so whenever you go for designing a system you have to provide specification. So, the specification uh, this ISA instruction set architecture can be considered as the specification and uh, this instruction set architecture is, uh, is I mean uh, to realize the instruction set architecture you uh, implement a or synthesize a hardware. So, the specification is the behavioral description what does it do, what the processor can do, then the synthesis step attempts to find an implementation based on the specification. And then comes the processor uh, which is an implementation of the design and uh, how is it constructed. That means, instructions processor, processor design concerns with how a processor is constructed. So, it is also referred to as micro architecture. So, a realization of an implementation a specific physical embodiment of a design is done using VLSI technology uh, nowadays. So, uh, I wish in this course we shall discuss about uh, the way this is how it is being done, but before that as we shall see later first we shall introduce the instruction set architecture. I believe before I proceed further it is essential to distinguish between these two terms which you will encounter quite often. The one is architecture, another is organization. So, what is the difference between the two? So, a computer architecture and computer organization uh, here as you can see architecture uh, 
is a short form of instruction set architecture. So, it is also known as instruction set architecture. As I mentioned, this is a programmer's view of a processor. So, uh, that means it, it it specifies what are the instruction and of our the different instructions that you can perform. That means uh, uh, the data transfer, data manipulation, uh, like that. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and then uh, then uh, the move instructions to transfer data between processor and memory, processor and I/O, uh, load, store, like that, and then. Uh, it will also provide uh, given idea about the different types of registers which you can use for uh, storing information temporarily while executing a program. So, registers provide intermediate inf uh, I mean storage and then uh, the you have you can have various addressing modes, uh, addressing modes allows you to access operands in various ways from registers and memory and also from I O. So, this is a architecture is essentially a programmer's view of the processor. On the other hand as I mentioned organization represents the high level design that means the way uh, the processor is implemented, how many cache memories it has got, how many arithmetic and logic units it has got, what type of pipelining uh, control uh, pipelining is being used what type of control design is being is done, whether it is a hardware control unit or whether it is a microprogram uh, micro control unit, uh, whether the processor is a single cycle, multi cycle, pipeline like that. So, these are all uh, decided as part of the organizations. So, this is also called micro architecture. So, this is sometimes known as micro architecture. <coughs> So, the structure of a computer that a machine language programmer must understand that is your architecture to be able to write a correct program for that machine and a family of computers of the same architecture should be able to run the same program. So, here as you can see uh, same instruction set architecture can be realized by a series of series of uh, machines or processors. They may be realized by using di in different ways, one can use uh, trans uh, can be realized by using transistor circuits, another can be by uh, integrated uh, VLSI circuits uh, and uh, they can uh, be uh, they, the implementation can be done in different ways, but as long as they execute the uh, same instruction set architecture, then we can say that uh, there is a kind of binary compatibility. That means, a program written for one machine can be run on another machine. So, uh, this is a very important concept and uh, this binary compatibility plays a very important role whenever uh, we go for uh, designing computers and we go from one generation to next generation of processors. So, you have to uh, incur, I mean you have to take into consideration the binary compatibility whenever you realize the next generation processor. So, that the programs developed for the earlier generation can be used, can be cannot be I mean need not be thrown away, need not be wasted and can be used. So, <coughs> now coming to uh, one very important uh, concept that is your Moore's law. Uh, Gordon Moore, uh, he was one of the founders of Intel. Uh, <coughs> he uh, proposed a law uh, based on some his observation. So, uh, the computer uh, uh, what, have, what, what has been done what has been found that the computer performance has been increasing phenomenally over the last five decades and this enhancement, this performance improvement is an outcome of uh, you can say Moore's law. So, this was brought about by Moore's law. Uh, what is that? Uh, Moore's, uh, uh, Moore's law states that transistor per square inch roughly double, doubles every 18 months. So, it is not uh, Moore's law is not exactly a law, but this particular uh, 
uh, rule you can say transistors per square inch roughly doubles every 18 months that has been hold good for nearly 15 years and this is the this is Gordon Moore he is one of the found, co founders of Intel and uh, this is what he stated back in 1965 in his famous paper uh, he wrote it for electronic magazine electronics magazine. So, uh, he was asked to write a article predicting the future of uh, electronic circuits. So, the title of the article was cramming more components onto integrated circuits and that was published in April 19. Uh, 19, 1995 issue of electronics magazine and in that uh, article he predicted that transistor density of minimum cost semiconductor chips would double roughly every 18 months. And obviously, transistor density is correlated to processor speed as we shall see. So, this, this shows the uh, this shows how Moore's law has remained valid for uh, for a large number of time for about 50 years you can see uh, here only the intel processors are being shown and uh, uh, on this side on the y axis you have got the number of transistors and on x axis we have got the number of the years so as you can see uh, as the as we go from 1970 to 2010 the number of transistors is reaching from 1000 to several uh, millions. Several millions of transistors uh, are used to realize processors. So, starting from simple Intel 4004, which was obviously having few thousands of uh, uh, I mean transistors to present day uh, dual core and multi core processors requiring multi billion uh, transistors, maybe tens of billions of transistors. So, this shows the, the how Moore law, Moore's law has really uh, influenced the growth of computers. And Moore's law is not uh, about just the density uh, of transistors uh, on a chip that can be achieved, but about the density of transistors at which cost per transistor is the lowest. That means, it not only says about uh, how many transistors you can fa fabricate but it also says how economically you can do the fabrication that means how that means you have to realize i mean transistor uh, ic's with more number of transistors uh, in a uh, economic way cost effective way so as more transistors are made on a chip the cost to make each transistor reduces but the chance that chip will not work due to defect arises of course this this problem is there and that is that you have to take care of it by reliable processing uh, te uh, te uh, technology. And uh, Moore observed in 1965 there is a transistor density or complexity at which a minimum cost is achieved. So, based on uh, uh, I mean a minimum uh, where the transistor density or complexity at which a minimum cost is achieved he proposed is law which has become famous. So, uh, we can say that the initial computer performance improvements came from the use of uh, innovative manufacturing techniques, advancement of VLSI technology and which actually uh, based on Moore's law you can say and improvements due to innovations in manufacturing technologies have sl slowed down since 1980s. Of course, the the grow the rate at which it was growing has slowed down since 1980s so smaller feature size gives rise to increased resistance these are the two reasons number one is smaller feature size gives rise to increased resistance this is one problem second is larger power dissipation so as we shall see the pentium processor uh, generates about hundreds watts of uh, power dissipation. So, 100 watts of power dissipation from an IC uh, is a very large power dissipation. So, this this power has to be dissipated with the help of suitable packaging and cooling technique. And so, as you put more and more transistors, the uh, the power dissipation increases, the cost of packaging and cooling increases. This is one 
uh, parameter which is uh, which limits the uh, increase in number of transistors on a chip. <coughs> so, uh, a decade and uh, as I mentioned a decade ago, ago chips were built using 500 nanometer technology. So, 0.5 micron technology you can say and in 1971 10 micron process was used and more most processors are used are currently fabricated on 65 nanometer or smaller process. So, nowadays uh, because of the advancement of uh, VLSI technology thanks to Moore's law uh, which has been followed. Uh, the it has progressively I mean the dimension has reduced gradually from 500 nanometer to, uh, so to sub micron technology. Now as you can see we nowadays we use 65 nanometer or smaller process maybe 45 or 33 nanometer. So, Intel in January 2007 demonstrated a working 45 nanometer chip and Intel started mass producing in late 2007 based on this 45 nanometer chip. So, uh, you can uh, you it is very easy to pronounce this 45 nanometer, 33 nanometer and like that, but you think about uh, the diameter of an atom. So, diameter of an atom is of the order of 0.1 nanometer. So, we can see that we are very close to the diameter of an atom. So, the precision at which the VLSI technology VLSI fabrication is taking place nowadays is not far away from the, uh, the diameter of an atom. Okay. So, this particular table gives you the amazing decades of microprocessor evolution. So, as you can see uh, from 1970 to 1980 the transistor count was uh, 2k, 2000k. Uh, and clock frequency was 0.1 to 3 megahertz and number of instructions per cycle was 0.1. That means, you required 10 cycles to execute an instruction and in 1980 to 1990 the number of transistors increased from 1000 k to 1 million and uh, the, the speed of increased from 3 to 30 megahertz and number of instructions um, uh, per cycle also reduced. So, you can execute uh, more number of instructions in a point one. That means you can more or less execute one instruction per cycle. And uh, then in 1990 to 2000, the number of transistors increased from 1 million to 100 million, and the speed increased from 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz, and uh, number of instructions per cycle changed um, reached point one, point nine to one point nine. So you may be asking, how is it possible to execute? more than one instruction per cycle. Later on we shall discuss about that. Uh, that can be done by using superscalar architecture and later on we shall discuss in detail about it. Then came the 2000 to 2000 the present day techno technology where you can have 100 million to 2 billion transistors on a single chip and speed is from 1 to 15 gigahertz. So, uh, 1 gigahertz means 10 to the power 9 hertz. So, you can see uh, the speed at which it will work and then the number of instructions per cycle is again between 1.9 to 2.9 and it can be still more. So, the processor performance uh, has become twice as fast after every 2 years and memory capacity has increased twice as much after every 18 months roughly based on following Moore's law. And I should mention about another uh, name called uh, go, uh, Mead and Conway. Actually, they described a method of increasing hardware design designs by writing software. So, whenever uh, the number of transistors in a processor increases, it is not possible to do the design manually. So, you will require autom automated technique. So, uh, Gordon Moore developed uh, this uh, 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 or develop this hardware description language by which you can uh, you can automate the design of a processor. That means whenever you are going for designing uh, processors with millions of transistors, you have to use CAD tools, computer aided designs tools, and uh, Mead and Conway was the founder of that. I mean they proposed the uh, 
this method for creating hardware designs by writing software. So, by writing software you can design hardware that was a important uh, step. Question arises how can you improve performance? So, initially as we have seen the improvement occurred because of the advancement of VLSI technology, but in subsequent years uh, other thing other uh, the performance improved improvement came from exploitation of some form of parallelism. So, uh, uh, some form of parallelism uh, were used in in these in these processors first is instruction level parallelism. What do you mean by instruction level parallelism? Instruction level parallelism means you know normally the execution of instruction take place serially. Serially that means uh, you execute, you fetch an instruction then execute. So, you can say that instruction cycle can be divided broadly into uh, two parts instruction fetch plus instruction execution. So, uh, first you perform fetch one instruction, then you execute it, then you fetch another instruction, uh, another inst this is for instruction one, then you fetch another instruction and then execute another instruction that second instruction. So, in this way it goes on serially, there is no parallelism, but subsequently techniques were developed uh, for instruction level parallelism and uh, pipelining is the first technique which exploit uh, which used instruction level parallelism. In pipelining you will see the instructions can later on we shall discuss in detail, uh, we shall see the instructions can be executed in overlap manner. That means, a say that instruction fetch uh, when you are execute performing instruction fetch of instruction 1 in, uh, or instruction execution of instruction 1 you can perform instruction fetch of instruction 2 and then again instruction execution uh, of inst when instruction execution of inst instruction 2 is going on then you can perform instruction fetch of instruction 3 and in this way it goes on. So, later on I shall discuss it in more details and also there were other techniques uh, which were used which is known as dynamic instruction scheduling in which uh, multiple instructions can be uh, scheduled uh, dynamically with the help of hardware and uh, particularly uh, wherever, wherever you have got uh, um, multiple uh, execution units and then out of order execution can be performed and then superscalar processor where you have got multiple processing elements uh, within a single processor. Then you can have VLI, VLIW architecture uh, which, which, which can use superscalar architecture. So, uh, the, the compiler will, will pack several instructions in a I mean several instruction in a single instruction and which can be fetched and executed serially. So, these are the uh, this, this instruction level parallelism I shall discuss in detail in my lecture. Then there is another level of parallelism, second level of parallelism that is your thread level parallelism. So, thread level parallelism you can say it is medium grained and, and different threads of a process are executed in parallel on a single processor or multiple processors. As you know, uh, <coughs> Uh, we, you are familiar with uh, what is process. Process is nothing but a program in execution. Then a single process can be uh, can have multiple threads you can say, multiple threads which can be executed in parallel if you have got multiple processing units. For example, in a superscalar architecture, you have got multiple processing elements. So, different threads can be executed in different processing elements. So, for example, you are uh, performing a loop program. In a loop program, different iterations can be considered as different threads and which can be executed on 
different uh, uh, processing elements in a single processor. So, a loop can have uh, multiple threads. So, uh, this thread level parallelism is another uh, medium grain compared to uh, instruction level parallelism which is fine grain. So, you can say uh, you can categorize in three types, first one is instruction level parallelism, instruction level parallelism or in short ILP this is your fine grain. fine grain. The second is your uh, thread level parallelism, and which is medium grain. <coughs> and third uh, type is uh, as we shall see later. Uh, process level, process level parallelism we, and which is uh, coerced grain you can say. So, these three levels of types of parallelism can be used and uh, this uh, simultaneous multi threading is a technique for improving the overall efficiency of superscalar CPUs using hardware multi threading. That means, in a single processors where you have got multiple functional units uh, of a, in a um, that is present in a superscalar processor, you can have this hardware multi threading. That means, this uh, thread level parallelism is exploited with the help of hardware and which is known as SMT or simultaneous multi threading. And then of course, you can have software level uh, multi threading on multiple processors or coerced grain um, uh, multi threading, software multi threading that can be done on multiple pro processors or cores. So, this is your uh, symmetric multiprocessor SMPs, this is very popular shared, shared memory uh, multiprocessor architecture. So, here as you can see you have got multiple processors, multiple processors, each processor is, is having a uh, private cache, uh, each of these processor is having a private cache and all of them are connected through a bus to main memory and I O. And this is, uh, so this, uh, this memory, main memory and I O are shared and sharing is done through a common bus and it is called symmetric multiprocessing. The reason for that is uh, each of these processors will take the same time to access main memory as well as I O. So, it is, so the access time for main memory and I O devices is symmetric for all the processor or uniform. So, it is also called uh, uh, uniform processor architecture and process level as I mentioned process level or coer scan architecture where you have got different processors that can be executed in parallel on multiple processors and you can use symmetric multiprocessors as I have already shown. Also, you can have distributed memory multiprocessors as you shall see in this diagram. So, this particular model which I have already shown here each processor is has got a uh, private cache and there is a shared bus through which main memory or shared memory is accessed, uh, accessed. So, this is called uniform memory access because each of them uh, can access it in a uniform manner and it is also called symmetric multiprocessors as I have told. Then you have got non-uniform memory access, here as you can see uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the memory is distributed, main memory is distributed uh, and uh, when, when this processor is accessing this memory obviously, access time will be smaller. When this processor, processor 2 is trying to access the main memory uh, attached to processor 1, obviously it has to do it through this network or called interconnection network. So, whenever it is accessing through this interconnection network, the access time will be longer and also this access time uh, can be variable depending on the uh, 
then on the type of network being used and availability of the network. So, this is your distributed memory multiprocessor where you have got uh, multiple processors and the different memories attached to different processor are, are accessed through a uh, interconnection network or it can be a local area network. <coughs> now, uh, what is the objective of this course? So, I have discussed broadly given an idea about the different types of processors that you can have and also you have discussed about uh, the different types of uh, parallelism that is possible, instruction level parallelism, thread level parallelism, process level parallelism and different types of processors architecture. Now, uh, what is the objective of this, uh, uh, this uh, advanced computer architecture course? Uh, we shall see that modern processors such as Intel Pentium, AMD Athlon etcetera use many architectural and organizational innovations that has not been covered in the first level course. So, each and every student uh, who are attending this course must have attended a first level course on computer architecture and organization. So, in that first level course, these advanced topics were not in covered. So, which are and, and it is very essential uh, for them for the computer science uh, students to learn these uh, details of these processors. So, particularly uh, the various innovations that have been used in implementing these processors, then innovations in memory, bus and storage designs as well. So, as we shall see, we shall discuss about hierarchical memory organizations, the way uh, the performance gap between memory and processor can be bridged. Then we shall also see multiprocessors, how multiprocessors can be realized and clusters can be implemented. And, uh, <coughs> And in, in this way, you can say the objective of this course is to study the architectural and organizational innovations used in modern computers. So, in a single sentence, we can state the objective of this course, study the architectural and organizational innovations used in modern computers. Okay. Now, let me give you an outline of the course that I shall discuss and the course has been divided into several modules, five modules. So, in module 1, uh, I shall present the review of the basic organization and architectural techniques. So, fundamentals, the uh, fundamentals of uh, different I mean processors uh, like RISC processor, what is RISC processor, what is uh, CISC processor and uh, what are the characteristics of uh, RISC processors and what are the differences between RISC and CISC processor and then the classification of instruction set architecture. These we shall discuss uh, in this uh, particular module and also we shall discuss about the, uh, uh, the way the performance of processors are measured. So, it is very whenever we say high performance question naturally arises how do you really measure the performance. So, we shall discuss about the technique by which the performance can be specified and performance can be measured and uh, we shall review these performance measurement techniques and then I shall discuss about the basic parallel processing techniques as I have already told instruction level, thread level and process level and uh, I shall also discuss classification of parallel archi architectures uh, in this uh, module 1 the various uh, parallel processor architectures that is possible. Then coming to module 2, I shall focus on instruction level parallelism and as I mentioned the first approach uh, which exploits instruction level parallelism is pipelining. So, basic concept of pipelining will be introduced and based on that basic concept uh, we shall discuss about the uh, the arithmetic pipelines, how different arithmetic operations like floating point addition, then integer multiplication can be performed pipeline that I shall discuss, but 
most important is the instruction pipelines which are used in all modern processors. So, I shall discuss in more details about instruction pipelining and particularly whenever you go for instruction pipelining, uh, you will find that there are uh, different types of hazards that is present in uh, uh, pipeline processors. That means, whenever you do instruction pipelining, you want to uh, utilize each and each and every cycle, processor cycle, but unfortunately because of various types of dependencies like data dependence, control dependence and structural dependence, you will find that it is not possible to uh, avoid uh, these hazards and uh, I shall discuss about the three different types of hazard that is your structural hazard, data hazard and control hazard and also we shall discuss uh, uh, various hazard resolution techniques uh, that can be used. Then uh, as I mentioned, I shall discuss about uh, dynamic instruction scheduling uh, that can be uh, that is important in the context of uh, your superscalar architecture and also branch prediction technique which is related to control hazards, how we can predict branch and we can minimize the effect of control hazards. Then uh, we shall discuss about instruction level parallelism in using software approaches and as I as we shall discuss about supercalar techniques, speculative executions and uh, highlight how these various uh, uh, techniques have been implemented in modern processors. So, I shall review some of the modern processors. Coming to module 3. Uh, I shall discuss about memory hierarchies. As I, as I mentioned, uh, the speed of processor is increasing and later on we shall see the speed of memory is not increasing at the same rate. So, how do you bridge the gap? So, to bridge the performance gap, one important approach that is being used is known as hierarchical memory organization where memory or is organized in a hierarchical manner uh, uh, in terms of speed. So, process and the memory which is very close to the processor is known as cache memory. Then you have got main memory, then the, the, third, the third type of memory is secondary memory. So, I shall discuss about uh, these different types of memories like main memories, cache memory design and implementation. Uh, virtual memory design and implementation, then secondary memory technology and also I shall discuss about RAID which is used in the context of secondary memory, redundant array of independent disks that I shall discuss and how it is used to improve reliability as well as performance. Coming to module 4, I shall discuss about thread level parallelism. Uh, uh, and in this context, we shall discuss centralized versus distributed shared memory architecture, then various interconnection topologies, multiprocessor architectures and then symmetric multiprocessors and in this context, uh, there will be a problem known as cache coherence problem because whenever you have got private cache and shared memory that will lead to cache coherence problem uh, uh, leading to some inconsistency in the uh, information that is stored in memory and how it is overcome we shall discuss. And then multi core architecture uh, is, an, is essentially an extension of multiprocessors in which the diff different processors are implemented on a single chip. And I shall discuss about modern multiprocessor give a review of modern multiprocessors. Coming to the uh, fifth module where process level parallelism will be considered. I shall discuss about distributed memory computers, different type, different uh, alternatives, possibilities and three different types of computings which are be increasingly be becoming popular. One is known as cluster computing, grid computing and cloud computing that I shall cover in this uh, process level parallelism. So, with this we have come to the end of this lecture. And in the next lecture, we shall start with instruction set architecture. Thank you.